When you take a look at Amazon, Best Buy or similar retailers, it is easy to get overwhelmed not only by the sheer amount of TVs, but also all of their features. I mean, quantum dot technology, LED, mini LED, OLED, latency, pixel response time. It can be hard to stay on top of things, especially for people who just aren't as tech savvy as you and I might be. So today I'm gonna review the Hisense 65 UHGQ and walk you through it. And by the end, you will see that you don't necessarily have to spend a lot of money to get a TV that checks all the boxes. By the way, hi, my name is Timo and welcome or welcome back to my channel. So this TV has got a 4K quantum dot IPS panel with support for Dolby Vision and HDR10+. It is rated for up to a thousand nits of peak brightness and it has a contrast ratio of 1200 to one which is very, very good unless you have a really bright living room, in which case that could possibly be not sufficient. Most notably though, it's got full array local dimming with 120 individual zones. If you didn't know, that means that there are 120 individually backlit zones in the TV that adjust the brightness separate from each other. So in theory, one half of your display could be completely at max brightness, while the pixels on the other half could be completely turned off, making it actually black. Or more frequently, the delta between the brightest and the darkest parts of an image is bigger than on TVs without local dimming, giving you that bigger contrast ratio. Not all TVs can do that though, which means that on those TVs without local dimming, the blacks are never completely black, but rather gray since the backlighting always has to be on. So as I said, that gives you the benefit of a higher contrast ratio, but on the flip side, there are only 120 local dimming zones, which in return means that scenes like a night sky look a little bit weird on here because the local dimming zones are quite a bit bigger than the objects that are supposed to be illuminated, giving you what is called a blooming effect. With an OLED TV, that wouldn't happen because those do not have LED backlighting. Instead, every pixel lights up individually, getting rid of the blooming effect in darker scenes because with an OLED, a completely bright white pixel can be next to a completely black one but they're also a lot more expensive. IO is also reasonably good as well with four HDMI 2.0 ports. Yes, I know, no HDMI 2.1, so you can't utilize the native 120Hz screen by gaming at 4K 120, but there's still support for eARC at least. Also, there is a digital audio, a headphone jack if that's what you need, two USBs, one of which is USB 3 and the other one is USB 2. And as for wireless connectivity, it's got Wi-Fi 5 and Bluetooth as well. Oh, and I guess there's also a satellite input if that's what you want. Although this TV won't win a prize in terms of design, the picture quality is actually fairly impressive for the money. It comes with a regular stand that looks like you'd also find it on a monitor, for example, but I decided to use the 400 by 400 vase amount to get this 25 kilogram or about 55 pounds monster onto my wall. And it's been sitting there for a good five months now, so I've had a good amount of time to gather my thoughts on it. All right, so to preface this, I am not the biggest pixel peeper in the world, okay? I can tell when some basic things are off, but I do not have fancy color calibration or other measurement tools. So everything I say is just purely my opinion and not necessarily backed up by numbers, and you might not even share my view. So the best advice is to just go into a store and look at the TVs yourself so you can figure out what kind of quality you like. With that said, I think the image looks really, really good. I'm sure you'd find a color profile that you like and I have selected the filmmaker mode as this is supposed to give you the most accurate representation of what the directors and editors want the content to look like. And it's been like this ever since. You get Dolby Vision and the viewing angles of 178 degrees make it very easy to look at from every possible direction. The colors are quite accurate as far as I can tell and the local dimming zones do a good job of helping with the contrast. But as I said, the blooming is quite a big deal and although I rarely notice it when I'm just enjoying the content on screen, sometimes it is so strikingly obvious that I can't help but notice it, which then can make the scene look worse in my opinion. It doesn't happen very often, but it does indeed happen. But even older pieces of content look fantastic. I rewatched the first Avatar movie and it absolutely blew me away. That was the first time that I watched that movie on an actually good display and it definitely delivered. When it comes to gaming, as I said, no 4K 120Hz, which is kind of a bummer, but you gotta cut some corners somewhere to get the price down. So I'm not really mad, especially because I just have a PS4 and not a PS5 
and I sure as hell know that my PC isn't gonna handle 4K 120Hz gaming at all. I know it would have been cool in terms of future-proofing reasons to just have it, but I can understand that it's missing, even though it probably wouldn't have brought up the price too much. Anyway, it has an automatic low latency mode and variable refresh rate, so gaming is quite fun. And although you do feel a little bit of latency, especially when gaming on a Bluetooth controller, but for the games that I play, which are mainly just casual games like FIFA, GTA V, Need for Speed, it is more than playable. So if you're very, very serious about gaming, maybe you should look at a different TV, but for a casual round of FIFA in the evening with the boys, it is more than enough. The sound quality is decent as well, with a 20 watt subwoofer and four individual 10 watt speakers firing up and down the TV. This enables support for Dolby Atmos and because the body of the TV is relatively thick compared to like an OLED screen, which is completely flat, it allows for more room for bigger and better speakers, which is why I think they are very good in terms of TV speakers. And with the amount of adjustments you can make to the sound, you can get a reasonable sound experience out of them. For example, there's a bass boost option, which I actually have set to plus two, since the subwoofer is used pretty conservatively out of the factory. Now, again, it is a 20 watt subwoofer, so do not expect theater-like performance, but it is really handy to be able to adjust that. And if you really want to, there's a full-on equalizer you can play with. That said, I will definitely get an external sound system at some point, like a soundboard, for example, mainly because I found that, as with most TV speakers, dialogues can be a little too hard to understand sometimes, but overall, I'm very, very impressed. You could definitely get away with using the built-in speakers only, but I'd like to have some audio that matches the video quality. The UI is fairly intuitive as well. The quad-core ARM-based processor runs their software VIDA 5.0, VIDA 5.0, and on the home screen you get a couple of frequently used as well as suggested apps. On the remote there are also the obligatory buttons for Netflix and Amazon Prime. Weirdly, no Disney+, Plus, but there's this Rakuten TV. Nothing too crazy in the UI apart from that. You can tweak some settings like brightness, picture modes, like I said, but I'm guessing most people are either going to leave it as it is or put it into filmmaker mode, but you have all the options to choose from. All right, so all of that is nice, but what about the title? How much money should you spend on a TV in 2023? Well, I'm kind of torn here because who is the average buyer of a new TV? I'm guessing that most people who are in the market for a new TV could not care less about enthusiast features like different picture modes, automatic low latency, bass boost features, or even this TV's key selling point, the full array local dimming. What I believe most people are looking for in a new TV is a 4K resolution, smart TV capabilities, the size, maybe brightness, and finally cost. And if that's all you care about, then you do not need to spend a lot of money on a new TV at all. If all you want is a TV to sit in your living room that you can use to watch Netflix or sports on in the evening, you can get great 65-inch 4K smart TVs from Amazon, Best Buy or whatever for as little as $400. If you're trying to build a gaming slash home theater setup in your living room, then you're gonna want to look at some more expensive models with some additional features and technologies. So if you are a little bit more demanding and know what you want, you can of course always just sort by the specs, which is essentially how I found my TV and at the time I only paid about $800 for it, which I think is a no-brainer. Anyway, I hope I could help at least one of you and if so, or if you enjoyed watching, please let me know either through a like or a comment. And aside from that, I hope you have a wonderful, wonderful day and maybe I'll see you soon. Peace.